able to hear them. So one quick Zoom tip. I know we are all on Zoom meetings all the time. I know right now, if you have your camera on, you are looking at your own face. You're adjusting your hair, making sure you're in the center. This is a good best practice. Up in the top right-hand corner of your picture, there are three little dots. If you click on those three little dots, you have an option to hide self-view. If you hide self-view, everyone else will still see you, okay? Your face will still be there, but you won't see your own face. So a hide self-view is a great little tip that you can use whenever you're on a Zoom meeting. Everyone else can still see your smiling face, but you do not have to look at your own smiling face. Go ahead, you can do that hide a self view if you'd like. We're going to run through our agenda here briefly. So let's go ahead and get that popped up. That's the way this is going to work today. We're going to take, we've got about eight more minutes. We'll do some intros there. Then we're going to get right into the panel. We're going to get to hear from these leaders for about 60 minutes. After 60 minutes, it's going to be time for some Q&A. I have no doubt that once they start talking, you're going to have some questions. The way we're going to run Q&A today, we said we're gonna be very active down in that chat box. Throw any questions you have down there. We have Katie Lane on the call, Frankie as well. She's gonna be capturing all of this and leading the Q&A once we get to that portion of the event. Then we'll have about five minutes at the end to just wrap up and close. So we'll get intros kicked off with me. Most of you on this call know me. My name is Liz Haberberger and I run Dale Carnegie here in St. Louis and over in Kansas City. So most of the state of Missouri is what we cover. Today though is all about ST. We got some St. Louis people on the call. So we are going to intro them we're also going to have them do a little bit of the intro themselves. We're not reading their whole bios. I'm going to give you a few quick nuggets. Our panelists are going to tell you two things. One, they're going to tell you the size of their organization. They even helped me out with that and said that would be valuable. So we'll hear how big their organization is. And they're also going to tell us one quick thing they love about working in a St. Louis-based business. We will start our intros with Mr. John Regan. John, uh, you can see up here on the screen, I will not read it to you. One very interesting thing about John, Sealy companies, they don't call their people employees or team members, they call them Keelians. If you work at Keely, you are officially a Keelian. So John, if you wanna just hop off mute, just tell us how big Keely Companies is, and then also let us know, what do you love about working in a St. Louis space business? Absolutely. So welcome, everybody. Excited to be here today. Uh, the Keeley Companies is a diversified company, uh, property development, construction, infrastructure, and technology. Uh, we are headquartered here in St. Louis and work in all uh, of the United States as well as in Canada. So exciting uh, growth of the Keeley Companies. One of the things that we love about St. Louis, uh, in addition to the weather, which, you know, if you don't like it, wait 20 minutes, uh, is the fact that the community always rallies together to make life better. Uh, and we are not flyover states. Uh, we are the heart of the country. So we love St. Louis at the Keeley Companies. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, next up, I have no doubt that if you have been to a grocery store in the last 12 months, wherever you go, you've probably been in a schnooks. And we are very lucky to have Laura Freeman here on the call with us. She is the chief people officer for schnooks, big, huge grocery here in the Midwest. Laura is very involved in the St. Louis community. So Laura, if you'd like to go ahead, hop off mute for us. I think People are familiar with Schnooks, but just give us the size. What do you love about working in a St. Louis based business? So good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm excited to be part of this panel. Um, I think you know Schnooks is a regional grocer. We're in four states. Um, we have about almost 15,000 teammates. And um, we also have bake, a bakery, a floral design center. We have our own transportation and logistics and then our corporate office. Um, one thing I like, well, I guess a couple of things. One is the name recognition that Schnooks has. Um, it's still family owned and we continue that. Our, our next generation is already in the workforce. And another thing is all the things that Schnooks does to really give back to the community. 
So just great to be here. Thank you, Laura. Next up, we will go to Doug, Doug McDermott. Here's a fun little fact about Doug. When I first met Doug, I, I told him he's a unicorn. So we are very blessed today. Unicorns, we know how rare they are. Doug has such a unique perspective on culture and learning and development, and a ton of experience to back that up as well. So Doug, if you'd like to hop off, tell us about First State, how big First State Community Bank is, as well as one thing you love about working in a St. Louis-based business. So I, I woke up this morning and I asked myself, will she call me a unicorn? And you did not disappoint, Liz. <laughs> Um, you you are the first, but I will forever treasure it. So it's great to be with everybody. Um, I have been here at First State Community Bank uh, for about five years, and we've grown in that time from about 300 to 700 employees. Um, actually, the only one not really based in St. Louis, I think. And being about an hour south, um, we get to reap the benefits of being close enough, but still um, connecting with our rural communities. And we are in about 60 uh, communities across Missouri, um, all over. And, and it's great that we're able to serve and help our communities grow stronger, um, achieving you know, financial success. Um, our team uh, gets to work and really help both the organization as well as our people become the best version of themselves um, with a growth mindset. And, and that's really what we try to do and, and make our community stronger. Thank you, Doug. Now, uh, many of you on this call, I've managed to find four other people that Angie Schaefer had not met before. But if you are in HR in St. Louis, you are probably familiar with Angie Schaefer. She's very involved in many HR organizations here in St. Louis and loves giving back to the HR community. So we are blessed to have Angie Schaefer from Safety National here on the call. Angie, if you want to hop off, tell us how big Safety National is and what you love about working in a St. Louis-based business. Yes, good morning, everyone. Thrilled to be here. Um, Safety National was founded in 1942, and we're a leading specialty insurance and reinsurance provider. We're the market leader in excess workers' compensation for self-insured employers and a leading provider of risk solutions for large commercial and public entity clients. We are headquartered here in St. Louis. We have 14 offices throughout the, the U.S., um, similarly to Doug, when I joined Safety about seven years ago, we were just over 300 employees, and now we've grown to over 650, and most of our employees are located in St. Louis, um, and I would say one of the, the many things that I like about being a, a St. Louis-based company is the, the philanthropic commitment that businesses make, especially Safety National, to our communities in which we live and, and work. So thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Of course. All right. And last but certainly not least, we have another financial institution here on this call. Uh, Ryan, we talked right before we got on. Doesn't he look tough with like his new short <laughs> haircut? He looks so tough in that picture. And we are very blessed to have Ryan here on the call from Commerce Bank. Ryan, if you want to hop off, tell us how big Commerce is. And what do you love about working in a St. Louis-based business? Sure. So uh, we are at Commerce Bank. We are, are a financial institution. We're what we call a super community bank. So the way that we talk about ourselves as a bank is that we're not necessarily your big, huge, your U.S. banks of the world, but we're also, you know, not necessarily a community bank. So we have the feel of a community bank, but a lot of the resources that you would see in some of your larger banks. Um, we have about 47, about 4,700 people in the bank. And uh, we are also dual headquartered. So we're in St. Louis, but we also have headquarters in downtown Kansas City as well. So we're very kind of Midwest driven as far as a bank. And I would say for us, it is about the community too. We heard a lot about the other individuals saying that for us, we're very connected to the community. I love working for an organization that's very connected because you know St. Louis to me is just a big, small town. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to be really involved in the community. Absolutely. So we're going to get to dive really deep with all of these panelists in four key areas. Up here on the screen, you can see we're going to talk about culture and what that looks like in today's world, how they're able to maintain that virtual work. I know many of us are still dealing with that in some degree, in some capacity. We'll talk about agility and how are they building this agile organization. And then finally, how do they create leaders at every level? 
not just at the most senior level, but all the way down through the ranks. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we don't need to look at that. We're going to hear our panelists. You do have a few options when it comes to your view. Most of us are very familiar with Zoom. Right now, you probably see those lots of little tiles where everyone's face is small. Up in the top right-hand corner of your entire Zoom screen view, you click the view button, you have an option to click speaker view. If you select speaker view, simply that will make whoever's talking, their face is going to become bigger and everyone else will stay small. So if you would like to see their faces a little bit larger or have whoever is speaking be more pronounced, you can go ahead and switch to speaker view over gallery view. Just a little zoom tip. So we will go ahead and get started. We're going to start on that first one talking about culture and really maintaining a strong corporate culture. We have five companies, in different industries, different sizes. So we're going to start, we'd love to just level set. And what we'll do is we'll go through and if you all could just kind of how would you describe the culture within your organization? What's it like and how have you maintained that over the last 12 months? So Ryan, we'll go ahead and start with you. If you want to give us an overview, how would you describe commerce's culture and how you've maintained it? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we actually have what we call a culture pyramid. I know that sounds probably pretty crazy, but there's a lot of pieces in that culture pyramid. And it really starts with what we call kind of our purpose. And our purpose is to help you do what matters most. And if you can think about that from a banking industry, that sounds, well, that's kind of weird, but it isn't like whether you want to save money to retire or to buy a car or to do anything, or even internally to grow, to develop, that's really what drives us. That's who we've been for almost 150 years as a bank. So on top of that, we also have what we call our edge, which is we use the Sen Delaney model. And so this gives us a consistent language across the organization. I've worked for a lot of different St. Louis companies. I never had one that was so easy to talk to other people about what that culture really is. Now, on top of that, we kind of layer a couple things on. We really think DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely important. That's been part of our culture pyramid for a long, long time. We also think development is important. So I run a program called Commerce for You. And that helps us really make sure that we're thinking about development as an organization too. We talk a lot about innovation and we also use the agile methodology here also. And all of those things are wrapped up in what we really call our culture. And we make that happen and we keep it in the organization to keep it kind of top of mind all through a bunch of culture champs. So we have master champs, we have super champs across the organization. They're helping us spread and remind people to keep culture top of mind. I think that's been a really, really important thing for us. How have we kept that going? I think a lot of communication and a lot of connection. So we really amped up the communication. During this time frame. we were, uh, for the first eight months of this, we were doing a communication daily about what you needed to know. And then our CEO was doing a communication every Friday. We, we've tailed that back a little bit. You know, we're doing it twice a week now and the CEO communications probably every other week or monthly but that was super important. We also gave people a lot of resources when this first happened because um, people were unsure. We only had 2% of our population that was actually working from home or working remotely. So it was a drastic difference to go from two to about 80% of our population starting to work from home. And so we needed to give them resources technically, but we also needed to give them resources to figure out how to work through this, this idea of working from home. So that was a big, big part of it. But because of our culture, because of who we are, because of those edge concepts we talked about, we really leaned into those and it just gave us an opportunity to connect and take those into a different format instead of just working in the office. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, we'll hear this probably as a common theme through a lot of our panelists. You cannot over communicate. That was something we had talked about on our on our pre-call. They all over-communicated things. Angie, do you want to talk a little bit about how would you describe the culture at safety and how have you maintained that this past year? Yeah, so the, the safety national culture is really how we live our values. We truly believe that our continued business success depends on our culture and a strong culture. We have five core values, and they are relationships, integrity, teamwork, balance, and stability. And our values guide all that we do. They aren't just words on our website or printed on logo items. 
um, but they inspire us to be intentional in our business dealings and our interactions with one another as colleagues. And they provide us focus regarding the decisions we make with, that really impact our employees. Um, in fact, our core values are so important to our culture and what it means to be an employee at Safety National that they're actually included in each of our job descriptions. And ultimately, our strong culture is what has gotten us through the last year and the reason why we were able to transition so quickly to working remotely. Um, similar to what Ryan said, you know, our CEO, um, in an effort to help us stay connected, addressed our employees weekly via video, and later it evolved to video messages from the entire executive team and department leaders. Our fabulous communications team came out with a weekly uh, newsletter on all kinds of topics, whether they were related to the business or just how to, you know, keep your head above water when you're working at home and you've got your kids virtual learning as well. Um, we utilize Slack channels for informal communications to kind of replace that, you know, water cooler or coffee chat. Um, we also created a channel for our, our employees with children in their lives as a way for them to support one another in this very unprecedented time. Um, we have a very active events committee um, and events team, which is led by employees, and they were able to transition to virtual events and activities during the workday to provide us all with you know, much needed breaks of activities such as lunch and learns, family feud, bingo, and my team actually participated in a, a virtual escape room, which I had never done before. And thank goodness for my colleagues, because I would not have made it out of that room on my own. Um, we have annual celebrations, such as our employee anniversary recognition and holiday events that had to go virtual when possible. Um, or we changed it up completely. For example, none of our offices could have their annual employee picnic. So we sent picnic baskets to each employee's home so that they could share it with their families. And so those are just a few examples of how we've been able to maintain our culture when the majority of our employees have been working remotely. Thank you, Angie. So in kind of keeping in line with the importance of values, vision, mission, Laura, I know that's been key in the Schnooks culture. If you want to jump in next, how would you describe the culture there? Sure. So um, when we really talk about our culture from the time a candidate uh, is going through our onboarding process, we talk about our why and why Schnooks exists is we nourish people's lives. And certainly you, people go, well, okay, you sell food, you know, but it's really truthfully more than that. And, and we really, you know, it's something that we feel very strongly and we make decisions by when we talk about nourishing people's lives, it's certainly our teammates and then our customers and then the communities that we serve uh, across the States. But I think if we didn't have that last year would have even been more of a challenge because you really saw it work when we had to make decisions because, you know, 90% of our teammates were on the front line. Basically, they were essential workers. And, you know, um, and what does that mean? And when we really talked about nourishing um, people's lives, the first was the safety part. Um, how do we keep our teammates safe? How do we keep our customers safe? And many of you that, that shop, you know, every sometimes daily we change things and certainly weekly we change things and uh, we're able to do that. And then we also thought about how do we support the communities? And I think maybe many of you saw where we bought gift cards for every single one of our teammates, no matter what state they were in, at local restaurants to help those restaurants survive. And we did that a couple of times. And so, you know, really showing we nourish people's lives, certainly by the safety, certainly by giving back to the community. But another thing, too, is we were challenged and I saw I'm sure you saw this, too, from a customer standpoint, is trying to keep certain things on the shelf and having the, the things that, that everybody was looking for. And by that, from our merchandising side, really going to vendors that we never had bought from before and looking at other alternatives and things like that. So when I really think about the strong culture, we do follow the Sindelani model too. We do have five values that we um, incorporate in everything we do, but it really goes back to the why and that is nourishing people's lives. And that has been from 1939 all the way up to today. And it certainly was shown in the past year with, with some, of the, some of the challenges that we all had. Absolutely. That why is so critical and how powerful that it can last. That why can last for years. It doesn't need to change even through a 
pandemic, that why got you through. Yeah, absolutely. Now, John, you also had a lot of essential employees out on the front lines. So describe a little bit about Keeley's culture and how you were able to maintain that this past year. Yeah, so when we talk culture, we say fun family accountability and results. Uh, that's the, the words we use to describe them. And that is an offshoot of our, our mission statement and our values. Um, we have aligned our culture with being results on purpose driven. And so everything starts from the C-suite and the executive leadership team. Uh, and we empower our team members all the way up to and including uh, a first day laborer who's on the job. And so what we've done is we've distilled that, that cultural give back into six pillars of culture uh, of which I have involvement in each of them at differing levels. I run Keely U, which is our internal uh, career growth platform. Uh, I facilitate strategic planning for our business groups, which is a part of our Keeley way or strategic vision and, and process improvement. Um, Keeley One is a big one. That's our diversity, equity, and inclusion core team, making sure that we're addressing inclusion uh, across demographics uh, and, and inclusive of all demographics. Uh, a lot of Keeley Cares, which is our community outreach. We make sure that we're in the community uh, and I'm going to circle back to that one because that, that was really key to keeping us together during this pandemic. Uh, safety, our Keeley Safe program, obviously in construction, it does not take much uh, to end up with a fatality. And so we're very intentional about our safety and life in general. We have a Keeley Life program, which is mental health, well-being and wellness. Um, what we found to drive the culture during this pandemic, in addition to things like daily stand-ups, um, we had uh, and still do have bi-weekly COVID updates open to all team members, uh, but really doubled down on the community involvement, got out in the community to help those who couldn't help themselves. And so partnering our Keeley Safe and our Keeley Cares teams to be able to get out in the community, provide food. Uh, we, we partnered with the Urban League uh, and other organizations to be able to just give people something to do positively. So we didn't wanna hide. Uh, and again, we had folks who were working the entire time. So we supported them when they were doing that essential work uh, that everybody was doing. So it's very intentional and it's driven by the C-suite. I report directly to the CEO. We have absolutely regular conversations, if not daily about culture, certainly multiple times a week. Uh, and we've distilled it. I'm gonna just throw a link here in the chat if anybody wants to do a deep dive for it. But we believe that if you don't have a good culture, the results aren't going to follow. And we know that people are what make a business successful. So we double and triple and quadruple down on improving that continuously. Thank you, Jen. So yes, one, thank you for throwing that link in the chat, as well as everyone else. Remember, feel free as you're listening to this, if something sparks for you, throw that down in the chat. Let these panelists know what's resonating. Or again, if you have questions, put those in the chat as well. We'll be capturing those. All right, Doug, round us out here. How would you describe culture and how did you maintain it this past year? So when I look at our organization, ultimately, you know, it's about purpose, caring, um, and order so that we can do what we need to do to help our communities thrive. Um, when we look at why we exist, it's about communicating it in a simple fashion that people of all walks of life can understand and know ultimately that the impact um, of their daily work leads to greater impact. When it comes to culture as a mindset, you know, it's the collective mindset of the organization. And the logic being that if we can help all of our people um, think with a growth mindset, the organization then follows. And so, you know, whether it was by, by chance or, or some sort of great inspiration about a year and a half ago, um, we took some steps to simplify some of our language when it came to our core values. And we chose items that were directly related to growth mindset, knowing that if we can make those things very simple, um, easy to articulate, we'll help our people become stronger no matter what they're doing, whether it's at work, at home, in their life, in their community. So when the pandemic hit, you know, we have values including adaptability, courage, resilience, those things that allow people to face any challenge. And the, the great part was that we then had a language 
where we could talk about those things um, that were ultimately brought to the highest level because of the pandemic. And those, the, that collective mindset allowed us to make decisions um, based on who we are, why we exist, and we kept them aligned. You know, I think your, your values are that great um, litmus test of, of integrity. If this is who we are, you know, we're faced with decisions like, um, you know, do, do we make sweeping um, choices for all of our teams? Do we, um, yeah, and that's not us. So we had to go back to that core and say, how are we going to operate? And ultimately culture was a risk management strategy for us. Um, it became a risk management strategy. And I say for organizations that are um, smaller, who, who may not be well advanced in terms of putting, putting culture on the table, um, or folks who are maybe scared that that's some sort of intangible out there thing, um, it's a risk management strategy. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug. So one of the interesting things that I got from even just listening to them describe their culture is that their culture is constantly changing and evolving, right? They're constantly focusing on new areas. So we'll kind of ask a follow-up to this culture question. Panelists, whoever wants to take this, if you want, we can even, if you go down to the bottom, you have a little raise hand. You could just raise your hand. That way we'll know who wants to take the question. How was your culture changing, maybe even before pre-COVID? What were some of the things you were seeing in terms of shifts within your culture? Liz, I can't find the raise your hand, so I'll just- That's okay. Speak up. <laughs> um, not so much changing necessarily it, it, as you think of change, something different, but um, continuing to become stronger in this virtual experience really has reaffirmed how important our culture is and the importance and significance of in-person human connection, professional relationships, friendships among colleagues, and, you know, without any preparation or, you know, even expectation, we had to switch to completely virtual onboarding for our new employees. And since last March, 2020, we've brought on 65 new employees and they've interviewed virtually. They haven't necessarily come into the building yet. That's coming. And our learning and development team had to um, really put our core values in, in motion to adapt to these changes and um, put on our onboarding program, which is called um, Succeeding at Safety National. And so I think we just saw, you know, the, the, the culture change was more of the adaptability and our culture is what was guiding all of those major shifts that we had to do. Thanks, Angie. Laura, what about you? Yeah, I think for us, it's certainly not a culture change, but it was a behavioral change. So when you look at our, our five values, um, which are customer first, one team of merchants, Midwest family values, execute to win and try new things. I think it was the behaviors started changing. And so everybody knew our values and, and really understood it, but those behaviors started changing. It, one is because our customers change and they're asking for different things, even pre-COVID certainly during, and now hopefully soon post-COVID, but so how do we change our behaviors that match what, it, what, what our customers are asking for? Or even as we worked as one team of merchants, certainly that's an important part. When you think about, we order things a year ahead, you know, and they come in through our warehouse and then they get to the store and then they get to the shelf and then you, you know, you as customers, you know, but I think, you know, what does that look like? And maybe it wasn't as departmentalized as it was before. You know, how do we really work as one team of merchants to make sure that our customers have what they're asking when they come into our store or whether it's through Schnucks Delivers? So I think our, our culture hasn't changed, but some of the behaviors have started changing and evolving. And I think that's really important when you, when you talk about your values, what are those behaviors that you need to see that reinforce your values. And I think for us, that's what we've had to relook at. I love it, Laura. It's not enough to just have the values, but what do you need to, to show them? What, what does it look like? Yeah. Ryan, go for it. Oh. So I think, you know, for us, we didn't drastically change either. I do think that it 
we ended up really leaning into kind of our core culture and our core values. What I do think it did for us is it in some ways made us smaller. Because we're about a 5,000 person organization. That's a decent sized organization. It's not easy to get to know everybody. We do have six markets, we have expansion markets. So it, it's a real, it's a scenario where you can't necessarily get to know everybody in the bank easily. And most people don't know other individuals in different parts of the bank. And so for us, it's just made the world smaller because we are all on screen. We're all on the same level playing field, which I think has been very different instead of being in a conference room where one group's here and one group's there and one group's here and the other one's not even looking at the other groups or the other screens. and They're only paying attention to the people that are in the room. So I think across the bank, I've heard about now we're on a level playing field. We love this. How do we keep this? Because before we were very bias towards having meetings in person or having meetings over video conference. And it just, well, it made a lot of people feel felt out, feel left out in a lot of ways. And so how can we keep those pieces that are keeping us connected at a deeper level than we've really been in the past? And I think that's a lot of the conversations we're having right now. Thanks. John, what would you add? I'd reinforce that with the virtual technology. We had been using virtual uh, technology for some, quite some time, uh, not to its full potential. And this actually accelerated our adoption of a tool that we already knew was powerful. Um, but because of our culture of being results driven, we had set our scorecards already and we had a goal. And part of our culture is once you commit to something, you don't back down, you find a way to make it happen. And so that culture actually came into uh, the fore in this because we couldn't back out. Um, and it was, okay, we got to figure this out. And there were a lot of strong conversations driven by our field leadership teams in conjunction with each of the cultural pillar leads as to how we could serve them better. Uh, and I really, really think that was important is that it wasn't it wasn't necessarily not top down driven because uh, we did communicate from the top strongly, uh, but the front line had ownership and we supported them, which I always have believed is the appropriate model, uh, is that the leadership serves the front line and it accelerated that for us. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think we wanted it to go that way uh, because of the situation and, and the pain and anxiety that it caused, but we're excited that it did because now we have a competitive advantage uh, and a bonded team that's closer together than ever before. Thanks, John. So one, uh, oh, Doug, you go, man. Sorry, I couldn't figure out the virtual hand raise, so I <sighs> rock it out here. I, I think the thing that I would share is through challenging times, you get to see people sometimes who are unexpected or or who you may not quite know fully understand the culture. Mm. Up, and it becomes a real talent identifier um, to see those, those folks from roles that um, maybe don't fit um, what they're stepping up to do. Um, and, and you become more human um, as you connect with people. And I think that helps, and, and that's really connected with our, our caring culture, that we've got people who can do great things, even if we, we don't know all of what they can do. And these give them a chance to step up and show that. Absolutely. And so obviously virtual impacted everyone here, on, not just on this panel, but everyone sitting on this panel. What I learned when we had our call on Tuesday with these with these individuals is that none of them, they weren't like the most progressive companies out there like, hey, we're all on board with let's figure out a way to work from home. They had to adjust very, very quickly. So we'd love to hear, Angie, I know you had a huge transition to virtual. How has that virtual transition gone and what does that look like today? So fortunately, we did have um, work from home and telecommuting options for our employees pre-pandemic, um, but it was, you know, you're able to work from home six days a quarter. It wasn't, you know, multiple days in the same week. Um, everyone did have laptops and we could connect remotely. Um, due to inclement weather days here in St. Louis, we also knew that every employee across the country could be logged in remotely and our network could handle the capacity. So kudos to our IS team. Um, but having everybody shift out of the office obviously was something we didn't anticipate and we were able to do that very quickly. Um, 
but that being said, we, we certainly had challenges. Now, I would say um, our customers and our clients probably wouldn't have noticed a difference. And we did go out with a public statement that is actually still on our website that we were remote, but that, you know, we were committed to um, having the same standards. Um, but internally, uh, there were adjustments to be made. So even though we had work from home options, um, the kitchen table was no longer conducive to being at home and working from home, you know, five days a week. Um, we worked with our department leaders and determined there were some employees that, um, you know, and this was mandated work from home, it wasn't voluntary. Um, so we gave stipends out if they needed additional equipment that they need to purchase. Um, I purchased a new chair for my home office. Um, we were really just trying to find ways um, since we didn't know, you know, what was going to be happening when we initially went out, we thought we were going to be back early April and um, we're still remote. So that didn't happen. Um, you know, we flipped to video calls and meetings. Um, and that wasn't something we were doing with any regularity. We do have our regional offices and we had just started um, video conferencing between the physical offices, but not from our, our computers. So all of that was a huge adjustment. Um, we still kind of laugh with, you know, like we couldn't, I can't figure out the, the hand. We don't use Zoom a lot. We have WebEx and Teams. Um, you're still on mute is something we hear all the time. Um, but, um, you know, really um, it's, it's been a good process, a good transition, but regarding the, the future and what that might look like, you know, we've always believed in offering employees um, flexibility working from home or to their, to the work day. Um, and that's been important to our executives, but as companies consider what virtual work may look like in the future, um, we need to be mindful of the impact long-term. Um, virtual and remote work has a significant impact on employees mentally that we're really seeing now. Um, sort of that, you know, fatigue that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, just, I came across a recent Mercer employees sentiment survey. So this is Mercer surveying employees and they examined the impact of remote working on various aspects of work, both positive and negative. And the positive impacts, according to employees, were productivity, trust and leadership, work-life balance, health and well-being. Um, but the negative impacts were loss of culture, lack of inclusiveness, lack of networking and promotion opportunities. And the survey found that employees are missing social connections, networking, and the ability to actually leave work. Um, and so those are all things we're being very mindful of. And um, actually, we are preparing to bring our employees back to the physical office May 10th. Um, we'll be able to work from home three days a week and in the office two days a week. Um, and so for all of those reasons that were noted in the survey, um, we're really looking forward to being back in the office safely with our colleagues. Of course, of course. So all of our other panelists, you have uh, far more, what I would say is essential workers, frontline workers. So I'll throw it to anyone who wants to take it. How did virtual impact your day-to-day -day operations and what do you see going forward? John, you want to go first? Yeah, so the, the impact in the early stages was more significant than once, uh, you know, the science started to show where the risk actually was. Um, because construction is mostly outdoor, most of the work that we do is outdoor, uh, we were able to pivot uh, and make sure that our team members were appropriately safe with face coverings and things like that. But once we did that pivot, really the challenge became our office team members. And so we, uh, we have a COVID task force that's led by one of our executive leaders. We pulled him uh, from a president's role and actually uh, converted his role into leading our COVID task force and risk management. Uh, so he helped us to draft policies. Uh, we changed our office uh, for our offices. We changed to a 50-50 schedule uh, to keep down uh, the population and minimize the risk. Uh, we also did some facilities work to increase air handling capacity so that uh, air changes per hour were increased significantly. Uh, and then just made sure that for our office folks, uh, that they knew what resources were available to them from the uh, the mental health side of things. Our EAP program was pushed extremely strongly to our team members. 
as well as bringing in uh, some mental health experts and making sure that our team members knew, hey, we're all dealing with this and we're all struggling and it's okay to struggle. This is unprecedented. None of us have experienced this. I don't think any of our grandparents experienced this. Maybe some of the older ones did, but it's okay. And the uncertainty is something that we embraced and figured out as we went along. And I, you know, it sounds like we had a great plan and we did on paper, but it changed constantly based mm -hmm. on new inputs. So, you know, I could make it sound like it was great. Uh, it was an iterative process and we figured it out as we went along. And every time we made a mistake and went, wait a minute, that didn't work. We got back together, we debriefed and said, okay, now we're going to try this. And I think that attitude of we have to do this uh, really served us well in the long term for our team members. And have you thought about what the future is going to look like in terms of virtual work for Keeley? You know, it's it's going to be all over the map. Um, there, the offices, some, some jobs obviously support it well, others don't. Uh, and we don't have a well-formed plan at this point in time. We're still trying to see what it looks like. Is there going to be a fourth wave? Are the vaccines going to work? You know, uh, so we're taking it day by day and evaluating it based on new information as it comes. Nice. Laura, what would you add when another business with many essential workers? Yeah, that's right. So our, our corporate office is called the Store Support Center, and we truly believe that our job is to support our stores and our facilities. And we always say there's no cash registers at our corporate office or at our Store Support Center. So we always remind ourselves that. But we were kind of old school, to be honest, in our thought pre-COVID that, you know, if because our stores were open some 24 hours, some 18 hours, that we needed to be at the store support center because that was the best way to support them. And if we could, if we worked remote, we couldn't support them. So we really done a 180. And, and um, part of that was, which was really good, about six months pre-COVID, we did a very extensive business continuity plan. And it really opened our eyes we really didn't have the capability to have the store support closed and be able to support our stores. So we did lots of work around that and thank heavens we did. But what, you know, we're having those conversations now that what does it really look like? And we've done, knock on wood, all other areas have done a really good job of supporting our stores and our facilities. And almost even better because people were almost more available. You know, I think that mindset, if you leave at five or 5.30, oh, well, you know, but now it's like, I don't know if it's good because people I think are working more than they did, to be honest, but, you know, there is that balance. But, you know, we do know that, you know what, we can support our stores and our facilities and, and all of our teammates, and we don't have to be sitting here in the office. So it's been a true 180 for us than where it was um, probably pre-COVID, but we're still on that journey of really what does it look like, you know, uh, after afterwards. So. And so, Laura, just just curious for everyone here, what does it look like now when it comes to store support center? How virtual versus in person are you? Yep. So currently, we're still at twenty five percent, and um, we have very strict regulations here as uh, as the store too. You know, you have to check in, you have to do your temperature, and that type of thing. We did set up a what we call a COVID resource line, which has been probably one of the best things that we've done. We've had over 150,000 calls come into it. It is manned by teammates. And um, anybody has a, a symptom or have been tested or things like that. So that's really helped. Um, we are talking about opening it to 50%. Um, we do have some offices that are an open concept. Um, and so what does that look like? Because even though it, the distance, you know, we'd have to keep it and, you know, they don't have the walls and stuff. So, you know, 25% very strict regulations coming in. Um, I have to say, though, that the um, our executive team is called the strategy team. We have never not come into the office from get go. And that was strictly more from a communication standpoint and just an alignment standpoint. But outside of that, um, it's been 25%. And we've been very aligned to that the whole time. So nice. Ryan, go ahead. Sure. So, you know, I, I would say that we had a business continuity plan. So it was very similar to a lot of the things that John and Laura talked about. So I don't know that I'll spend my time there. Uh, but I think what we noticed after getting over the initial hump of getting out and technically was probably our biggest first challenge was were we really ready to help 5,000 people work from home? 
I don't think we were 100% ready, but we worked through it. It was an iterative. It was great. We figured it all out. We plugged in the spots with Zoom when we needed to. Um, I think as time went on, a lot of what John was talking about too, we were noticing you know, how, much, how stressful this was for people to try to go through this change. And so how do we really help people? How do we help them understand what's needed? We talk about the Zoom fatigue and burnout, but it, to me, it's a little bit more than burnout. I, I've done some reading around real, what's really the biggest part of that burnout. And for people, it's loneliness. Um, because whether we really think about it or not, as human beings, we need that, those interactive, those connections with others, even if it's 40 seconds, even if it's a minute or two minutes, whether that was at the copier, having a laugh, or you were talking to somebody while going to get some coffee, or you were, you know, we're at the water cooler and chatting about something, we're in the break room. It was so, so important. So how do you help people do that? And part of that is about connection and really giving the, and letting the managers and individuals know that you have to do this. In a lot of our meetings in our department, we are actually taking the first five minutes to just connect with each other. Really just have that opportunity to just, let's talk to each other, let's connect as human beings, let's have some fun, let's laugh, let's talk about our shared experiences. That is a big, big part of it. You know, and we are moving a lot into the, how are we gonna get people back to the office? So we are doing this in five phases is the way that we're looking at it. Um, though our retail branches are doing this in a much faster pace. Uh, when we first, when this all first happened, we were splitting our branches into teams. And so one team would, would, would work a week and one team would work from home and then we'd flip um, to make sure that, that we kind of had safety. And just in case one whole team got sick, we still had another team to be able to make sure people, we were there for our customers when it came to the branches. We're thinking a lot about now, how do we get people back to the office? So there's a lot of conversation going on. We are looking at all of our roles across the bank and saying, okay, so is this a role where we need people to be in person? And the reality is, is we have some of those, just, just like Laura and John and Doug and everyone, we, we have some of those. If you're in the branch, you probably need to be there. For some individuals that work with customers, you might potentially need to be in the office sometimes. But we're looking at, do you need to be in the office? Could we do a hybrid schedule? Or is there a possibility that working from home could really work for this job? I think about our whole IT department. I know they're very heavily into this process. I think we're going to have hundreds of people go home. We're going to have lots of empty floors where IT used to be. They're probably not going to be necessarily working in our offices in downtown Kansas City as much as they used to in the, future, in the past. So it's really into figuring out what does that look like and then equipping our managers to have some of those conversations knowing that just because we put a recommendation in front of you, we think the role needs to be here, you still have the power over that. And the conversation between you and that employee is the really, really important part of this. What does it make sense for your team? Um, one of the, I love this term, it's actually just came out the other day. We talked about kind of our is, you know, we help you do what matters most. We are now saying, when we think about this going forward in the future, what are those moments that matter? So what are those moments that matter for you to be in the office? whether it's a leadership training, whether it's a specific meeting or a team department meeting where you do all get together. And part of it is really about connection and spending time together. So what are those, what are those moments that matter? And that's gonna be a big driver of how people decide whether they're working from home that day or coming in the office, if you have that opportunity. Mm, absolutely. Uh, Ryan, if you've never read a book, it's called The Power of Moments. Chip and Dan Heath, it's a phenomenal book that goes right to that point of, of the impact moments can have. So Doug, Excellent. you're at a, in a similar business. How has virtual impacted you maybe differently than it has Ryan and Cameron? So I, mean, I think it's actually impacted very similarly, albeit on a, on a different scale. Um, and, and it couldn't be a better segue of what Ryan shared because for me, I think the balance we always have to strike as leaders and organizations is this pull and push between consistency and policy and flexibility. And somewhere in between is the spot where we have to engage those managers who we've put in positions and we all hope that they make great decisions that benefit the business, the teams, the customers. We now have to actually open up and let them be a part of the conversation. Mm. For some, that's, a, that's new and that's uncomfortable. And it's, what recommendation do you want from me as a leader? It's like, no, no, tell me what, what, what you know, what you feel, what you see. And on the flip side, leadership has to be comfortable being vulnerable with those people to realize that, that they're there because we need them to be able to make decisions and to make recommendations. 
And so for those of us in, in an HR or policy or strategy role, you know, we've got to have that balance again between consistency and flexibility. And while I have fewer answers about what that'll be for us in the future, I know that there's lots of conversations and lots of questions and building those partnerships um, with our leaders at different levels to make wise decisions. Love it. Trying to balance almost two opposite things right at the same time, but that really is where the sweet spot's going to come. So virtual has forced all of us to be agile, to make shifts. We just got to hear about some of the shifts that you have made. And Doug, that was a perfect segue into really the people shifts that we're having to make. Maybe it's inviting people into conversations, asking them to take on different roles or do things differently. Right, Dale Carnegie, we firmly believe that an organization's success is determined by its people. I know all of our panelists here feel the same way, and they spend a lot of time and effort on developing leaders and developing those key skills, not just at one level, but at every level. John, you mentioned on Tuesday, you know, Keeley has lots of different business units, lots of different levels. What has been a successful strategy for you and what are some of the key skills you're focused on developing and how do you do that at all different levels throughout the organization? Yeah, so emotional intelligence uh, was one that we doubled down on, um, brought in a great resource, by the way. We believe in sharing and sharing freely. Uh, we're an open book over here at the Keeley Company, so I'm just spitting things out to everybody. Uh, Carrie Goyette of Aperio uh, Consulting Group out of Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, Missouri. Uh, she's an author, uh, speaker, phenomenal scientist when it comes to emotional intelligence. Uh, two, and if I had a third and fourth thumbs up, uh, they would be for Carrie. We had her come in four times uh, over the course of the year talking about the importance of emotional intelligence uh, through all of the levels. And really one of the things we were we were fortunate again by design, uh, and this is, I think, where I double back to the, the concept of planning and, and strategic planning in specific. We had a plan from day one that our learning and development would be available to all members of the companies uh, and that we would, we would have it be open because I personally don't believe that anybody should not have access uh, to learning materials. Uh, let's be honest, technology is a great equalizer. And if we don't support our team members and give them the tools that they need to succeed, uh, the organization suffers. And so we've been structured since day one that anyone from the field level to the C-suite can participate in our training. And we partner with the best in the industry. Um, we, we follow an 80-20, uh, the Pareto principle. We follow the 80-20 rule when it comes to training. 80% is led by our internal subject matter experts. And the 20% of the uh, folks that we bring in externally are going to be world class, like Carrie, like Miss Elizabeth Haberberger and her team. We want to make sure, though, that that's available to everyone. And that was the, the big thing. We actually saw a bump in utilization of the L&D side of things uh, by our team members of 17% through this pandemic. Uh, LMS usage skyrocketed. Um, and the sessions that we did like this uh, virtually uh, we made it to where it was fun. Uh, this image behind me, this is my home office. Um, I'm actually not there, uh, you know, right? So virtually I'm sitting in a hotel room right now uh, because I get to go get vaccine shot number two at 10 o'clock today. So I'm literally like sitting here and as soon as I shut this off, I'm gonna jump in a truck and go get my second vaccine. Nobody would know, right? And so we just embraced that as a culture and said, hey, wherever you are, join us. If you're in a pickup truck, fired up, uh, by the way, the IT team went, you know what, data caps, we don't care. We're going to invest there as a, as a company. And so if you burn 15 gigabytes of data by being connected, that's an investment in our people. And that's what we looked at is how do we invest in our people? And that was, that's how we embraced that. Thank you, John. Uh, so emotional intelligence was key for you doing lots of different things at all levels. Who would like to build on that on our panel? And you can just hop yourself off mute. What are some of those key skills and how have you done that at all levels in the organization? Yeah, Liz, um, I'll go ahead. So for us, um, you know, when I think about, you know, talent within the organization, we look at the skills and the motivation and the, the alignment with our culture. So those three are very important. But I always say that our customers can never have any better experience than what our teammates have. 
you know, because we always say, oh, you have to give great customer service because that's so important. But unless we're giving that type of internal customer service to our teammates, it's really hard for them to give a better experience. So that's really important. But when we think about developing, you know, it, it used to be more of on a, from a leadership standpoint, but what we've done is we've taken a framework and we've divided it up into four areas and we have really focused uh, on these four areas. One is emerging leaders. Um, so somebody that, and we have lots of tenure within, within Schnooks, which is great. And a lot of them say, oh, I just started as part-time, you know, I was working part-time and stuff. Mm -hmm. But what we find is that they've stayed, they've started to grow their career. And, you know, I always tell a store manager, you know, drive down the street today and tell me who's running a $25 million operation that has 150 teammates they're responsible for, that understands merchandising, their PL. You know, the skill sets that a store manager has are, are incredible. So, you know, when we look at that emerging leader, you know, how do we how do we spike that interest of somebody going, do I really want to become, you know, an, a department manager? And what does that look like? And how do we start preparing them? So we've we really focused on the emerging leader. Then we look at the new leader, um, those that have taken on. Sometimes we think, and you know, I, most companies are, are kind of like this too, that, hey, we put somebody in a leader position, leadership position and they know everything already and, and, and they don't. So what are some of those skill sets that a new leader has? What are some of the challenges that they have? And what are some of the, the things that they need to do to continue growing their career? Then we look at the experienced leader, just because you've been in a leadership role for us for 15 years, um, you know, that doesn't mean you don't want to keep learning. And there are our customers are changing all the time. Our technology is changing all the time. So how do we keep those experienced leaders up to up to speed? And then we have an, an executive leadership program. So for us, it's really focusing on all of those. And we've probably spent more time in the past 18 months really looking at that emerging emerging leader program. And then um, we do have an internal competency model that we've, we've, we started when I came on board, we've had it validated, and we are now going back through what are some other competencies that should be really focused on. A couple of them are crisis leadership, and it's not just the crisis of the, the COVID, but you know, unfortunately, there's been some other things that have gone on within um, the civil unrest and things like that. Um, you know, so what is, how do you manage through that? And especially as a leader of, you know, 100, 150 people within your store, um, faster decision-making, you know, decision-making mm -hmm. was a key competency, but it has to be faster. How do you get that information quicker? And how do you make that decision? It may not be a hundred percent correct, but how do you make the best decision you can at a, at a speed faster than what you've made it before? Um, We've had change management, but really now it's being a change agent because the key, if you're a leader in any type of organization, to truly be a change agent is not only how you adapt to change, but how do you get your team to adapt to change? And that's truly different than change management. Change agent is truly saying, how do you become that and make those that maybe struggle more with change or you're moving change much faster, how do you really become that change agent? And certainly the last, which we had already had, but this is certainly elevated, is having a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. So for those, those competencies, if they weren't there, they are now, or they've, they've heightened in the importance across multiple roles. Wow, thank you, Laura. What an incredible overview of the different segments that they really focus on and some of the key skills that Schnucks is really working towards today. Ryan, you've got your hand up. What would you add to what Laura's already said? Sure, so um, when we think about leadership and kind of continuing to grow that, especially during this time, you know, we've got a lot of really great leadership programs. We've had those in there for a long time. They've been in place for a while, but similar to what Laura talked about, it was really focusing on some other areas. So for us, one of those areas across the bank was we about two years ago, and this was kind of weird, nice timing, we got rid of year-end performance reviews um, because they were just painful. People hated them, they didn't work. Um, so we actually changed to a process called Align. And in, in the Align process, we do a, a we do monthly conversation. So we have quarterly goals that we talk about in, in January, April, I think July and August or in September. And so we just do those quarterly goals. And then we have a touch base between those months. So we went from this, this archaic, hard, really painful process to just talk to your people, <laughs> like talk to them about their goals, have conversations with them. 
you know, make sure that they're on track. And that does help us stay on track a lot easier than before. And it was so nice because we put that into place before all this happened. But part of that was training up our leadership. It was really making sure that they were comfortable. We gave them skill sets in really two areas. One was around situational leadership. Like how do you really meet people where they're at to make sure that you are really helping them? And that's important because there's empathy along with that and listening. And as a manager, if you don't have that, you're not really a leader in my, in my, in my mind. So you need to have that piece to really truly be a leader. But we also really talked about things like goal setting and having crucial conversations and how that can potentially be hard. So we, we wanted to give people some real information around this to get them prepared because we wanted to make sure they were ready to have these conversations on a monthly basis and that they could have them. The survey that we've done from that was wonderful. And people, you know, we have got 80% of the people in the organization that are now increasing their amount of conversations and feel like they know where they're at with their goals than they ever have been previously. And so that was a wonderful thing. It was happenstance and weird that it happened right before all of this happened, but it was perfect because it's virtual. That's the way that it's set up. It's, it gives people a framework to really make sure they're giving people more and having those conversations and those connections. It's a big, big deal. The other thing we've actually Im implemented since this, which we're really proud of, is uh, what we're calling an aspiring managers program. How many of you out there wish you knew what you were going to get into when you became a manager? I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to make sure that people know that because how often do people get promoted just because they're good technically, but they might not necessarily be interested in really being a good people manager. So we have what we call an aspiring manager discovery session, and that's open to anyone at the bank, similar to what you were talking about, John. We don't care who you are. If you were here for a week, if you've been here for 10 years and no one's ever really thought about you as a manager, we want you to have that opportunity to learn the good and the bad and the ugly of what it really means to be a manager and what it means to be a manager at Commerce. And then at the end of that, you have to make a decision. So you go through that program and then you have to sit down with your manager and talk about, is management right for you? And you may say, nope, not now. Heck no, I never wanna be a manager after going through that, that is not for me. I might wanna be a manager, but I, not yet. And if you decide that you do want to be a manager, there's actually a six month program you can go into where we want to prepare managers. We want to prepare people that when those spots come open and they want to potentially be a manager, they're the best potential candidate and they're as ready as they possibly can be. So in that six month program, we call it aspiring managers journey to your inner manager. That's where you really learn a lot about the important things that you need to do to be prepared to be a manager. And those, both of those things, including a lot of the other things we do around IND and even also Commerce for You I talked about earlier, really help us continue to grow that leadership that we need in the organization to keep us around for another 150 years. Brian, what a key concept of investing in people before they need it. And you could say, right, well, but what if they don't end up becoming managers? Didn't you just waste all that money and time? Absolutely not, right? Because then what if they would have gotten into a management position and then you had to figure that out? So well, well worth it. Um, aspiring managers. Great. Um, Doug, we'll come to you and then over to Angie. You know, us, this is my first soiree into the financial industry. Um, I, I come from a background that doesn't have the type of compliance rules, the information security rules, all of those elements that are... Um, that have right and wrong answers. And so for us, as we develop people, I think we, we have a lot of folks who are really strong, but they're afraid sometimes to make moves if they don't have the right answer. So for we as you know, learning and development people, um, it's, it goes beyond you know, your, your 37 compliance classes. We've got to help you get comfortable with the uncomfortable, knowing that there won't be a right answer. You just have to make the best answer that you can. And getting people in a comfort zone there, I think, will pay off dividends long term. And, you know, I, I hate to say to maximize the pain that has been this, this COVID environment, but if there's anything that you can build off of in loft, it's that comfort with discomfort. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the other part is helping shift people to become self directed learners. We as development professionals, have no way ourselves of knowing every single thing you're going to need to be successful. So we've got to teach you 
how to identify those things you need, how to have a real honest assessment of your skills that you have, and then get you connected um, or open your eyes to where you can find resources that are good, whether they're curated by us or whether it's five minutes on Google. The information's there. You need to be free to go get it and then apply that knowledge the best way that you see fit. And we're going to be here ready to help you because, um, I mean, trust me, I'm the king of making wrong decisions, but I get better every time, you know, and I, I want you to be okay doing that too. Mm. What a great thing to hear from leadership, right? That it's okay to make mistakes. We work with um, another company. I'll give them a shout out, Vernon Jones. I don't think they're on this call today. Mike might be here, but they say, right, we don't expect you to be right 100% of the time. We expect you to be right 70% of the time. And if you're right 100% of the time, it means you're not taking enough risk. So there has to be that willingness and that it's okay to not always be right or perfect. Angie, what would you add in terms of how are you doing development at all levels and what are some of the key areas and skills you're focused on? Yeah, so you noticed I figured out the raise your hand. So <laughs> I, did. I did notice. Um, so I really wanted to, um, I'll answer that, but also wanted to, to point out that we may not be as far along as a, as a strategy for learning and development as my other panelists are. Uh, but kind of start where you are. And um, Liz doesn't know I'm going to say this, but Dale Carnegie, they truly did help us get started about six years ago. And um, we've collaborated to create what we refer to as our safety national leadership program and really kind of the fundamental fundamentals of what it means to be a leader at safety national. And um, I can't believe it's been going on six years. And about four years ago, we actually brought on very experienced learning and development team members. Mm -hmm. And so they've just been able to take what we started with Dale Carnegie and, and continue forward. And so we do have a variety of programs from, you know, entry level manager of people training. Um, we have some trainings and development programs for um, managers who are new to Safety National, even though they may have led people in another business, we, we have some things that are core to us that we want all of our managers to understand. And so we've been able to put some different levels in. And like Laura mentioned, we do have um, leadership programs for our executives and our senior managers. And that's called our, our pinnacle um, program. And so really it's examining, you know, where you are and what you can do, even if you might have um, limited resources or limited, you know, human capacity. And last fall, we launched our leadership competencies for um, managers of people up through the senior management level. And when we go through our performance appraisal process this summer, it will be the first time that those are actually incorporated into our metrics. So really looking forward to um, being able to, to have that as part of our professional development journeys and really understanding what we're expecting of our leaders and what people want to attain. And Ryan, I think I'm gonna be looking you up. Thank you for sharing about, you know, just giving people the, the understanding of what it means to be a leader of people, especially because it's hard and not everyone's cut out for it. So thank you for sharing. I'm taking my own notes. Um, and the other thing I would add is just um, really wanting to understand, um, you know, the emotional intelligence that we've, we've talked about. How are our leaders engaging with other people? What's that human component? Are they expressing empathy, especially now? Um, and how do they lead through uncertainty and empowering our people to make decisions? And if they're wrong, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to get back on track. And so I just wanted to offer those few comments um, for a company that is um, still on their leadership and development journey. Absolutely. So see, even, even our panelists get to learn things from one another and take some nuggets away. So I, I am hyper confident that we could sit and listen to these panelists for the rest of the morning. Unfortunately, we don't have the rest of the morning to sit and listen to all these panelists. So what we are going to do is start to get ready for today. I know there have been some questions dropped down in the chat. Katie's been pulling those. We'll give everyone 60, 90, maybe two minutes to put your questions down there. What are the questions you have? It could be generic for anyone. Maybe you have a specific question for one person. As we are thinking through some of those questions that we wanna ask, 
We're going to go back to our panelists one more time. They didn't know I was going to make them do this. But one of the things we do in Dale Carnegie is we often end a presentation or a talk with something we call an action benefit. Now, it's very clear and concise. It's typically done in less than 10 seconds. So we're going to see how adaptable and coachable these panelists can be. So you're going to give us, see if you can do it in less than 10 seconds, one action. What would you recommend other people on this call? What's one thing you would recommend they do? And what is the benefit for them and their organizations when they do that action? So I'll give you an example while you guys get to think for a second and we see some questions come down in the chat. So one example might be develop emotional intelligence. It will help your team connect better together. So that's one example of a very quick one action that we would recommend people take and what's the benefit for them when they do it. Yours does not have to be like mine. Yours can be anything you want it to be, but one action, one benefit. So we'll throw it. Whoever on the panel wants to take it and be number one, what do you got? All right, John Regan, I see you with the hand raise. All right, and just because I have a time commitment, so I've got a split, um, my, my action would be stop uh, saying that there are differences between people skills and business skills. And the they benefit the, is? The benefit is that people are business. And when we communicate, that way, business happens much more productively. Absolutely. And yes, just so you guys know, John is going to have to hop off a little early. He's not trying to dodge our questions, but he does have to go get vaccine shot. So we'll take you until you got to go. Laura, what about you? Really understand the needs of your workforce. And the benefit of that is because there's, so, there's only a finite resources and make sure that you're putting those resources where it makes um, more benefit to them. You know, I, I've been caught where, oh, this is going to be a great idea and they're going to love it. And then truly not understanding what the needs of our workforce or our teammates are. So mm. nice. Thank you, Laura. All right. Angie, Ryan, Doug, who's up? Um, I'll, I'll go. go. Oh, so going, um, thanks for putting us on the spot. Um, huh. what, my, what I would say is um, for everyone on the call, network with us, network with everyone else. I saw that Ryan threw his LinkedIn um, in the chat and I'll do that too. Happy to connect. It's so great to learn from others so that you can bring that back to your company. And that's exactly why at the beginning of the call or Zoom, Liz mentioned that I am involved with various HR professional organizations in the area because They've truly been a huge benefit to me and just really want to share and think differently. And, you know, Ryan, I have, seriously, I'm calling you. <laughs> so I'll give, uh, give Angie a little plug. If you're involved in SHRM, uh, HREN, those are two great networks that you could get involved in that Angie uh, helps to lead here in St. Louis as well. All right, Ryan, action benefit. What do you got for us? All right. Again, I want to get back to something I talked about earlier. We talked about that loneliness. Ask people how they're doing. And the Don't assume is? that they're okay. And the benefit is that it's going to be good for them and it's going to be good for you. You're going to know where they're really at. So just ask people how they're doing. So important right now. Nice. All right, Doug, last one. And then we're going to go to some Q&A. What is an action benefit you would have for our audience today? Um, my action is believe that people want to excel and have the ability because then the work that you do, you will raise the bar, be able to do more um, and get further when you're supporting them. Mm, absolutely. All right, so I have been seeing some questions come in the chat. Again, we have Katie Lane. Katie is a master trainer at Dale Carnegie very well qualified to lead a Q&A session. So Katie, we'll throw it over to you to lead Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Elizabeth. And thanks for those of you putting questions in the chat and collaborating. I know a couple of people put some additional resources there. One of the first questions uh, that David Singer asked was, uh, for the panelists, would you mind telling us or let us know what are some of the mistakes or the missteps that you made along the way? So maybe if we just hear from two of you, 
uh, on what, what maybe a mistake or an aha lesson learned was. I'll go. Uh, you know, Thanks, Laura, Ryan. Laura, I love what you had said earlier. And to me, that really, that really spoke to me is you've got to listen to the people. Um, you really need to make sure that you understand and you're giving them what they need when it comes from, from an L&D perspective. If you, um, you can think you know what they need, um, but it isn't necessarily always what they really need. So we do actually, again, use Agile. And a lot of that is about really making sure that you understand your customer and iterating as you're going through the process. So I think as we put things out in the organization uh, that we think are gonna be wonderful for people, we have to do that. When we first started doing a lot of this and we've rolled out probably 14 different development tools and resources in the last three years, probably more than we have in 10 years, just in the last three. And uh, sometimes they hit and sometimes they don't. And the ones that don't would probably because we didn't ask people enough to see if they really needed it. Nice, thanks Ryan, appreciate it. I've Doug, got go ahead. Here. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thanks. I, I I think the the mistake or the misstep for me personally um, is trying to eat the whole elephant. We have so much information that comes at us, so much research, so many emails, so many everything telling us how to do it right, better. You know, we have to get comfortable sometimes in the pocket of knowing it's about incremental progress. And, you know, I'm not where I'm going to be tomorrow. My organization's not where it's going to be tomorrow, but I'm better than I was yesterday. Mm. And that's okay. Um, and finding peace as a professional with that, because everybody who's on this call is obviously driven. Um, they're driven to help their organizations, their customers, that sort of thing. Um, I think we've got to get comfortable saying movement is what we're going for um, and one bite at a time. Nice. Thanks, Doug. Important reminder for all of us. And there was a couple of questions in the chat as it relates to those core values, uh, keeping that simple and working with um, external resources. If anybody has a resource, somebody mentioned CMA, uh, who some of you maybe are familiar with, but if you've got another resource that you've used externally to kind of help grow and build that culture, feel free to pop it in the chat. Again, we'll share some of these resources. Um, one, one other question based around training and development, just the percentage of budget that you allot to training and development. So if one of our panelists could speak to that one or two, how do you determine what's needed? So when I compared and benchmark my training budget, it's fairly small, to be honest, um, considering the size of the organization. And we do kind of bucket it because certainly we have what we call new hire training. You know, that's really learning the skill sets in whatever department you're going to be working in. And that's very important. Also, the, from a safety perspective. But then we really have, you know, more of that talent and leadership development. Um, I have to say, we put in Workday um, this two and a half years ago, and um, I think HR was really lacking from a technology standpoint. And by doing that, um, we, we went full on board. And uh, Workday Talent and Workday Learn has really helped reduce those budgets because of the ability um, to access our teammates that we have not had before. So if you think of we probably have 10,000 teammates that do not have email addresses that do, you know, obviously don't sit in front of a computer. You know, we have Chromebooks in our stores, but they're, they're usually in their areas. So this has really been able to access, it's a mobile app too. We've really been able to access that. And it's not, well, it has been all virtual, but certainly it, we've had some lessons learned from that. But uh, we have a relatively small small training and development budget compared to benchmark uh, other industries um, about our size. So, but we really yeah. leverage technology. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So that those are some interesting resources that uh, folks might use in order to be more effective with their own internal training and development to keep that investment lower for the external. 
another question, which uh, I'm sure a lot of other people are wondering about is, you know, due to COVID and the last year or so, uh, people are being stretched thin due to reduction in force and stress. Uh, it's caused some strain on some relationships within um, the office or people that work together. So how have you seen uh, to effectively restore some of those good working relationships? You know, when I think about this one, it, it's, I think when we went home and we went virtual, a lot of us thought, oh, well, that, that we're still going to work with each other. We're still going to connect. Um, but, you know, that, that team development, that team growth, that team cohesion, you know, um, that's maybe not as important or that fell to this wayside because for us, like as an organization, we were doing PPP. So we literally had 900 people in the organization helping all those small businesses that are out there that really needed to stay afloat. Um, so I think it's remembering that what you would have done in person, those, those abilities to get people together, to get connected, those, those small team events, the small coffees, all the wonderful things that a lot of you were talking about earlier that you're doing with your teams that we're doing. I've, in fact, I have one this afternoon. We're doing some sort of gift fun thing this afternoon and from 1 to 1.30 and I'm going to get a chance to see my team. Something <laughs> super fun. And we have to continue doing that. We have to continue making those connections, um, even if it's virtual because virtual can add an interesting depth. Like I knew my team members, but I feel like I know them to a whole nother level right now. Um, Cause when you're talking to somebody who's sitting in their home, you're seeing their children, you're seeing their pets, you're seeing their family members, you get a chance to get to know them. We're opening up maybe that self part of ourselves that we've been a little bit more private about in the past. And so I have to say that I am closer to everyone on my team that more than I've ever been. So ask those questions, talk to those people, take advantage, have events like that so that you can keep keep your culture alive, quite honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan, for those tips. What about one other person, what you've seen work well in your organization to help maybe restore those relationships or just keep them strong when you're not seeing people face to face? We're encouraging a lot of one-on-one -on -one check-ins that are not just work focused and also trying to help educate ourselves and our managers of people on what some of the warning signs are. You know, um, is someone seeming a little more agitated um, or short than they normally would be and not just letting it go because, well, they have a lot going on. Yes, they have a lot going on. So let's have a conversation with them. You know, let them know that we support them, find out how we can help if there's a resource available. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate that. We've had a couple of additional questions come through in the chat and some answers as well. A uh, question for Angie, which it looks like she did answer. Do you, uh, do your engagement efforts differ by location or department, or you try and do something um, that is like a one size fits all? And so Angie, I know you, you answered in the chat. Would you mind just expanding on that for a moment? Yeah, so we, we, I would say we started our fundamental level and again, using our core values. Um, we do engagement surveys every year, participate in best places to work surveys and our executives and our department leaderships um, really listen to those results, even if sometimes the feedback um, may be not what we expected. Um, I can say that that's not often that we get some unexpected feedback because we're very intentional with those results. We just don't do a survey and, oh, we've been rated as a, a best place to work and move on. Um, we're always looking at how we can um, improve and what our employees are saying. And that goes down to the department level, not so much the office level, which was part of the question in the chat. Um, because our departments span offices, each of our offices aren't functioning separately. We have, you know, departments are represented across them. Um, and so if there are particular challenges or an area we want to focus on with a department, we're able to, um, you know, pivot and make sure that we're placing focus on that department, even if maybe it's not a need across the, the company. All right. Thanks, Angie. Just scrolling the chat, we've got time for one more question here. So if there is something that our panelists have not addressed that you might be wondering about as it relates to culture or anything we've talked about today, 
You've got one op one last opportunity to put it there in the chat and we'll hear from them before we start to wrap it up for the day. See if anyone's got that final question on the tip of their tongue. Uh, I don't know. Just wait. Well, while we are waiting for maybe that last question um, to come through, let's go ahead one and thank all five of our panelists, even though John is no longer on the call. In your reactions down on your bottom toolbar, you do have some clapping hands. So give them some clapping hands, a thumbs up. There's some celebration. We do truly, we appreciate your time here at Dale Carnegie for volunteering to be on this panel. And I know everyone here on the call today appreciates your insights and the things that you have shared that are gonna help them grow their businesses. So with that, it looks like there's no more questions. So we're gonna get wrapped up, but to get wrapped up, we have to do one final thing. And I'm seeing a lot of faces on cameras, but if you don't have a camera on, Go ahead and turn it on. We want to see as many faces as possible. So I'll oh, see, look, all you have to do is ask sometimes and look at all these beautiful people starting to pop up around the St. Louis area. Up as many people as you can. Yeah, I see you smiling, Eric. Turn on that camera. Oh, there's Stegan. Emily's on. Oh, Ryan, that's your picture. But that almost looks like a video. Yeah, we want to see as many people as possible. Okay, so I'm looking at a lot of faces here. So not everyone's on camera. Is anyone here a tree? I'm seeing lots of faces. Mike, you don't look like a tree. Yeah, Ken looks confused by my question. Is anyone a tree on this call? You've got to give us a green check if you are a tree, a red X if you're not. Um, yeah, Kevin doesn't look like a tree. Erica, you look like a... Yeah, I don't really see many trees here on this call. I just see lots of people. Yeah, Angie is not a tree. Angie, look at you now. Now you found the, the hand raise and the red X. You're going to be like a Zoom pro. Ken's not a tree. Jake is not a tree. Yeah, no one is a tree on this call. Well, guess what? That is really, really good news. Because just like Jim Rohn says, if you don't like where you're at, move. You are not a tree. If you don't like where you're at right now, whether it's in the things you're doing day to day or where your organization is at right now, move, get up and move. You are not a tree. You are not stuck in one place. We've gotten to hear lots of different ideas today from some of our panelists that we can take to go move and make something happen to move us towards our goals. Remember, Deal Carnegie said, if you are not engaged in the process of becoming the person you want to be, then you are automatically becoming the person you don't want to be. So take something here that you've learned on this call, go out and start working towards the person or the organization you want to be. Thank you so much to everyone. A big thanks again to our panelists for being here with us today. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day and the beautiful weekend we're supposed to have here in St. Louis. Bye everyone. Liz, I'm gonna hop off. <laughs>